How many found that to be true? Uh, every one of us can testify to that. Can't be God-given. Good to see each and every one of you, those that are joining us via live stream. We're glad that you're going to worship with us tonight. We uh, want to go to the Lord in prayer. Ed Ramey called and asked that we would pray earnestly for Charlotte. Ramey, she's uh, still struggling with that uh, tumor. Uh, Danny Land came through his surgery. Uh, maybe be here tomorrow night, so let's hold him up in prayer. He is. is he here? Where is he? You just saw him? Oh, there he is. <laughs> A ghost. <laughs> All right, Dan, we're glad you're here. Amen. Well, now you know we like you. God bless you. All right. Sister Lewis, want to continue to remember her in prayer. Also, Sister Bartlett, want to remember Johnny Zimzak. Uh, he was in the hospital, better part of the day. They admitted him. He uh, was bleeding uh, severely, uh, and they found out that he has a tumor or some kind of a mass in his bladder and might be an infection. We don't know. So he's got to go see a urologist and uh, get that figured out. So let's hold him up in prayer. Also, Doc Kulo, his son's been worshiping with us. I don't know if he's here. I don't see him. But anyway, he had surgery today. So let's hold him up in prayer. And then Sister Linder, she's going to be having surgery. We want to pray for her. It's been a long time. She's really been anxious to get in the services, but she's in severe pain most of the time. <laughs> Helen Bechtel, Sister Lavina Nethers, we want to remember them in prayer. Sister Pettit, we want to remember our speaker, Brother Brad Epperson. And then I'll take your burdens by an upraised hand. All right, Brother Troy's going to come and uh, word the prayer. And let's be in an attitude of prayer. Pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening with humble and grateful hearts for all that you have done for us this week, Lord, and for the word that we have heard. And Father, we just do pray that you would continue as to bless us, Father, from your word uh, for these last few nights, Lord. We just pray that you would help us, Lord, to take each nugget of wisdom, Father, that we have received and encouragement that we have received this week, Father, and apply them to our lives. God, we just do pray, especially for Brother Epperson tonight, Lord, that you would just continue to use him, bless him, Father, give him the words, Lord, to speak to us tonight, Father. And Lord, we just do pray that you would be in each and every part of this service tonight. Lord, as we look out on this world, Father, as we've gone about our daily lives today, Father, we've just realized the great need, Father, of salvation for so many around us, Lord. There just is such a vacuum of wisdom and goodness, Father, in this world, and Lord, we just pray that in some way that you would help this church, Lord, help each of us as individuals to be lights to this city, Lord, and to those around us each and every day, Father. God, we just do also pray for these burdens that have been brought forth uh, this evening. Uh, we especially think of Sister Linder and Brother Zimzak and others that have been mentioned, Father, Sister Donna Bartlett, Sister Lewis, uh, God, we just pray that you be with each and every one of those needs tonight, Lord, and with each and every one of those uh, hands that were raised, Lord, we each carry burdens for our family, for our loved ones that are lost, and God, we just pray that you would speak to each and every one of those needs and those hearts, Father, that have yet to receive you, we just pray that you'd speak to them tonight as well. And God, may everything that's said and done tonight be to your glory and honor. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Like that. 
thinking today um, as I was meditating <clears throat> you know when you get a certain age you know you're getting closer to the gate and and I thought there is a there is a uh, I don't know what I want to say uh, an eagerness I guess to go um, it's not a fear it's a happiness it's a happy yeah. feeling I don't know what's over exactly on the other side. I know where I'm bound to go. And and I sometimes, you know, you think of the things that's going on in the world and all, and it's like, get me out of here. But uh, praise the Lord. We have a we have a hope. God help us. God help us to be more excited. For the things of this, things of the Lord, and not the things of this earth. And I've heard it said, make sure what you're living for is worth dying for. Amen? Think about that. 
What are we living for? What burns in our heart? What is our priorities? What do we put our hope into? It's something that we can all ask ourselves. Amen. Turn to page 486. This beautiful song as we take the evening offering. Heaven holds all to me. Praise the Lord. Thank God it's real. Praise the Lord anyways. Earth holds no treasure but perish with you, see. However precious they be. Yet there's a country to which I am going. And Brother Gabe has a song for us tonight. Hey, did you see him? Oh, there he is. All right. God bless you, Brother Gabe.
Amen. Thank you, Brother Gabe. Brother Chad has a song for us tonight before the message. Pray for him as he comes. You know, I was, we were singing that song. There is just no place like home. And you know, if there was ever a prodigal son, that was me. And I'm so thankful that when I started to come back home, when I started back, I knew I was raised in church and I knew where I could find help. I came to myself. I came down that road. And God was waiting with arms wide open. He ran down the road to meet me, just like that in the parable. I'm just so thankful for his mercy. You know, the devil tries to bring shame for the failures that you that you had. But you know, it's under the blood, and then you just shove the devil's nose in that, and he can't stand it. But I'm so thankful for what God did for me. Listen to the words of this song. Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way and was wretched and vile as could be. Savior in love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. I was near to despair when he came to me there and he showed me that I could be free then he lifted my feet gave me gladness complete when he reached down his hand for me When my Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for me. I was lost and undone without God or his Son. When he reached down his hand for me, how my heart does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice in the tempest to him I now flee. There to lean on his arm, safe, secure from all harm, since he reached down his hand for me. Sing it with me. When my Savior reached down for me, Done without God or his son when he reached down his hand for me. I 
was all make Brenda nervous. She's thinking I'm going to sing with Chad or something. But thankfully for y'all's ears, I only testify. You know, he sings that song. You know, he reached down for me. And you think about the miry clay and all the, you know, Chad's not the only prodigal son around here, every single one of us. I've got an old house where I work, and I had an issue with the septic. Have any of y'all climbed down into a septic pit or into a septic line that you got to repair? Any volunteers? You want to talk about a stench. That's where we were. That's where I was. And I'm talking a stench, you know, a stench that you just get near it and it's on your clothes the rest of the day. We had a bucket down in this hole because it's been opened up for a little bit. And this is old, this is old clay tile, you know, 18 inch clay tile butted end to end. No, no seal joints, whatever. So this is just leaching out, you know, it's. It's not perforated pipe like it is now, but it still leaches out. But I've had this hole opened up for a couple weeks now. And I've literally had that septic draining into this hole for the last two weeks. And I had to climb down in there today and fix it. And I, and I knew I was doing it. We made plans. So I brought my big rubber boots from home. And I stepped down into this pit and it just, I, I instantly went ankle deep and just, that miry clay that just drew you in. And I'm so thankful today. And, and I mean, there was stuff I had. We pulled it out and I power washed it and that, it just stained. It stained and it would not come out. Luckily, I was just throwing it away. But I, I cleaned it off just because I didn't want, you know, stinking up the dumpster for whatever it was worth. But I'm so glad that I don't have any stains. I'm so glad, you know, he, Chad, he, he, he likes to brag, you know, he's every single one of us, we were right there on that road with him, and I know Penn Dilly talked the other night, I was saved when I was four years old, sister, be glad you were, because there's a lot of heartache that you haven't gone through, I'm thankful for that heartache, don't get me wrong, I'm thankful for that heartache. I've got something I can teach my kids. I got guides, you know, along my way. You know, I went outside those bumpers. But I've got experience, and I've, I'm right there with Chad, every single one of us, whether we want to admit it or not. But I'm so glad I'm out of that miry clay. After seeing that today, you, you know, sometimes you just don't realize how bad it was. And then you had a... <laughs> Had a good experience in it today, and I'm just so thankful I'm out of that miry clay. Amen. How, how many of you have been delivered from the septic? We all have, haven't we? God does such a wonderful job of salvation. <clears throat> it's miraculous when we think about where we came from and what we were and what we could have been and what we were. Oh, thank God for a so great a salvation. Thank you, brother, for the testimony. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Brother Brad Epperson. He pastors the Church of God in Clay City, Kentucky. So let's receive him with a good amen. amen. All right. Thank you, dear brother. I appreciate that. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, would you join me in a word of prayer just before we get into the message? Our Father in heaven and... The name of Jesus, Lord God, I believe, as I'm sure about everybody else does here tonight, in that presence of God that is just everywhere, that omnipresence of the Lord. But God, tonight, what my heart yearns for is that manifest presence, Lord, that you would just come in that rich fullness among us tonight. And I believe you've already done that. 
I pray, Lord, you just, you just keep doing it and help me to preach tonight uh, the Word of God so that others might just rejoice in the Lord and what He's done and what we have in Him. Father, we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. My, what a place to be again tonight. I ought to be here and worship and listen to the testimonies, whether rendered to us in song or, or in just straight-up testimony. Thank you. Thank you all for that. I appreciate that so much. That just couldn't help but listen and just be reminded of the young man who had decided that he was going to go off and make his own way and be the king of his own life. And all he ended up being was the prince of hogs. And uh, when he got home, oh, the star of that story, the star of the story, of course, is that father who comes running to him, amen, and says, son, home is where you belong, and I sure am glad you're back. I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'm thankful for God's mercy. Every one of us here have been, uh, have been blessed by the mercy of God, and we're so thankful for that. There's not a one of us that was, born, <laughs> that was born into this world and lived such a life that we deserved any, anything from God other than His wrath and judgment. But because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, He has given us something altogether different than that. He's given us mercy. He's given us salvation. He's given us a new name. Amen. And I am very, very thankful for that. Well, tonight, as I get ready to get into the scripture, I was just going to share with you a little, little uh, tidbit of something. Our church on, uh, on Sunday nights, we've been doing something a little different for a few months now. We, uh, at 5 o'clock on Sunday nights, we come in. We told everybody, we want you to donate some things to us. We want you to donate all your, all your mismatched plates and cups and glasses that don't have a full set with them anymore. And uh, bring those in, and they did. And so what we do on Sunday nights is we sit down and eat dinner together off real plates. I'm big on that. I like that. Real plates and real forks. And we sit down and we eat dinner together as God's people, and we pray together, and we enjoy one another. We enjoy a meal. And at the end of the meal, it's usually me. Sometimes it's somebody else tells a, a brief Jesus story. And we call that the table. We sit at the table together and we just enjoy the fellowship of one another and our story about Jesus. I told the story this past Sunday night and I'd like to share it with you uh, this evening just as a way of introduction to get into the message that the Lord, I think, has for us tonight. And it's a story, if you want to go and look at it, you're welcome to. It's just a few verses. I'll catch them, just maybe one or two verses from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. It says, and when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? If you put together Matthew's account of this woman in her oil, along with the, the account probably more likely in the book of John, you could probably find it around chapter 12 of John, if I remember right. And you, you kind of go back and forth between those two things. Some things emerge in that story that I think are pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the Bible tells us that Jesus was staying as he often did when he was in Jerusalem. He didn't stay in Jerusalem. He, he would always go that short distance outside uh, and stay at the home of some friends. And he would stay with these friends named uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus at a place that is interestingly called here in the Bible. It's called the house of Simon the leper. The house of Simon the leper. And at this house of Simon the leper, it never tells us that Jesus has any interaction with Simon himself. He doesn't seem to be in the story at all. Maybe he was and it just doesn't say it, but... But I think his absence from the account says something. It just says that they were at, at his house. And when they were at his house, who, who was he with? Well, he was with these three siblings who were Jesus' friends. Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And by the time we get down to the 26th chapter in, in Matthew's gospel, we're getting very near to the passion of our Lord Jesus when he would go and he would suffer on our behalf. And so, so by that time, he's had quite a history with them. You remember that there were times when Jesus would be teaching and he would teach in their home. And you remember that Martha was 
always busy about things. She wanted to make sure that the table was set right and she wanted to make sure that dinner was served and the dishes all got washed afterward. But Mary always seemed to find a chance to go and sit down at Jesus' feet because she wanted to be... She wanted... There was something in what he was saying that just her heart was needing to hear it. And so Jesus said to Martha when she complained about it, he said, now listen, Martha... Your sister has chosen the better part, and I'm not going to take it away from her, right? It was Mary and Martha who sent a message to Jesus once that their brother was very, very sick and that Jesus needed to come and to because they knew that if Jesus, if Jesus would come, that it would be no problem for him to heal him. But, and you, you know the story as well as I do that Jesus gets there late. And, and by the time he's there, Lazarus was buried four days back. And when he, when he wants them to roll the stone away, Martha puts her foot down and she says, no, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. By now, he's in the ground and he's thinking and we don't, we don't need, it's, it's bad enough. Lord, we were already disappointed. We were disappointed when you didn't come. But, but Lord, don't embarrass us now by exposing the stench of our brother's death uh, to the whole world. No, and, and, and he says to her, Martha, listen to me now. I'm the resurrection and the life. I come to get Lazarus and get him out of the ground. And so he calls, well, they've got a long history, long history. But, but we find this, this account here in Matthew 26. He was here at their home, which is called the home of Simon the leper. And, and John tells us that it is Mary in his account in John 12, that this is, this is who the woman is. It's Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, who comes with this alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And, and in John's gospel, I believe it tells us specifically what the oil is. It is the oil of, it's the oil of spikenard. And spikenard, I don't want you to think that that was something that Mary might have run down to the uh, local uh, drugstore and bought a bottle of that. That didn't come from anywhere near there. It wasn't from, from the land that they lived in. As a matter of fact, spikenard came from uh, the far, far east. It came from over at the very extent of the trade routes where those caravans would come across India and, and out of the far east. And, and they would bring this spikenard on, on camels and it was very expensive even in its native place. But the idea that Mary even has this spikenard is just about hard to compute. It's hard to figure out what that is. How does this woman... And we find out in John's Gospel also when the, when the disciples complain about it, they say, oh, what a, what a terrible waste this was. They put a price tag on that spikenard that Mary has, and, and it's 300 denarii. And I know you and I don't deal in denarii very often, but remember that a denarius was about the value of one day's worth of hard labor. And so when you, when you kind of figure on that, we're talking about, it's about a year's, it's about a year's wages in this, in this amazing treasure that, that Mary has, right? And, and the first question I got to wrestle with in my mind is, what, what in the world is Mary doing with such a thing anyway? Where does, where does a girl from Bethany come by a treasure like that? You know, these people live on the very edge of deprivation. These people live uh, in, a, in a place where there's no safety net. They live in a, in a place where people, people went hungry, where they, where they had a hard way to go. And this woman has got this treasure. I want to know where it came from. And I'm going, I'm just, bear with me for a minute. I'm going to tell you the assumption, and I may not be right about it. You, you, you may have heard others talk about this assumption before. Uh, I, I think it's likely I may not have it right, but I think this is likely the case. Where, where, were, where were they staying again? In Bethany at the home of who, who was it? It was Simon. It was Simon the leper. Only Simon doesn't seem to be there. As a matter of fact, Simon, unless something had happened to bring him healing, Simon could not have been there. Either he's already dead from his leprosy or he's not. But in either case, the, the moment when this man looked down, whoever he was, the moment when he looked down and he recognized that there was something wrong with his skin and he went and had it diagnosed as leprosy, the moment he was told leprosy, he was told, you go home and get everything that you have to have out of your house and go, get out. You can't live in your house anymore. You can't be with your family anymore. 
You can't, you can't live among others anymore. You've got to go out there and join a colony of lepers and live completely apart. And I can just sort of in my mind imagine Simon going back home and thinking about all the things that he'd have had to do, right? Thinking about all the, all the, the, the fears and the worries that he would have had as a father. He's got these three children. Uh, Lazarus, the son, who he was going to give all his stuff to anyway, but he was going to make sure that his daughters, uh, Martha and Mary, had, had, had husbands and married well and, and were taken as good a care of. But now he's not going to be there to, to, to oversee those things. And so what do you do? What do you do with that? And so I just, in my mind, I, I just see him sort of casting about in his mind as he's going home to collect what he can. And I, and I just kind of, in my mind, I think this is what Simon comes up with. He takes what he has, what money he has, and whatever he's been able to store and put back. Maybe he's already started the dowry fund for, for, for Mary or, and for Martha. And he goes off and he, he finds somebody selling something. And he says, I've got to make an investment. And he buys a treasure. And before he leaves, I, 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 think, I think this is likely the case. I think what he did is he put that treasure in, in, I don't know about Martha. The Bible doesn't say anything about Martha, whether she had any, I don't know. It's talking about Mary here. And he puts that treasure in, in Mary's hands. He says, I've got to go. You'll probably never see me again. I'm probably just gone, but... But listen here, I, I want to give you this. And, and in, this, in this little alabaster box here, there's, there's, there's your future here. There's, there's your life here. This is, you're going to use this as a treasure and it's going to be the dowry and one day you're going to find a young man and, and this is what... I know, I know, Mary, listen, I know that not everybody's going to want to marry the daughter of a leper. But I'm giving you a treasure and... And, and, and people will know you have this treasure and, and it'll be a dowry and it'll be what, what makes your life better. It'll be what makes your life easier. It'll be what makes your life work for you. So Mary, just guard this very well. Guard this very well because, because all your hope is in this, right? Yeah. And so, and so Jesus has come and he's in her house. I don't know if people were knocking down the door to come and see Mary, the daughter of the leper, or not. I don't know if she was attracting much attention or not. I don't know. But I do know that there was a man who came. And his interest in her was not romantic, but redemptive. <laughs> I just want to say it again to our young people here. You're going, to have, you're going to have a lot of stuff out in front of you. You're going to have people who are interested in you for good reasons and not so good reasons. You're going to have a few people along the way you'll meet who'll have some romantic interest in you probably. Can I tell you, find the one first that has the redemptive interest in you. Find the one first who cares about your soul, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's him. And, and, and contrary to all hope, here comes, here comes a man into her home, but this man comes, he's the son of God, you see. And so when she's sad and she's listened to him, you know what it is to be alone and afraid? Are you with me now? I feel like I've lost you. Do, do you know what it is to be, to be anxious and to be worried? To be afraid? Like, you, like your whole future is not under your control? And like you're just hoping for the best, but you really don't know how to make anything work out right? You don't know how, you don't know how it's all going to go? And, and the, the, just the, the recklessness and the chaos of the world is, is about more than you can stand? I just think about this poor woman. I just think about this poor woman and she's looking at this little treasure she's got and it's supposed to be everything, but my goodness, it seems so very small. And she says, do I, do I really want, what am I doing with this anyway? I want to go out there and, and, and buy a husband with it. Is that the kind of, of kind of man I want to have who's only interested in me is that he can have this treasure, sell it and get the money out of it? What do I do with that? But the longer she spends sitting at the feet of this Jesus and listening to him, Right? And when she stands in a graveyard and she's completely broken because her brother's dead and now what are they going to do? And this Jesus calls her brother out of the grave and gives him back to his sisters. Right? And then here it is, Jesus has come back to Jerusalem again and he's sitting, he's sitting here at this table and she's, for some reason, she's gone and gotten this little box out and and she, she comes with it and she just stands behind him knowing what she wants to do. I mean, this is her everything. And she just crushes it. 
Alabaster is soft. It's a soft stone. She just crushes it in her hands. And everybody there in that whole house is startled by it. They're startled by that, right? I mean, they would have been, I mean, the sound of that breaking alabaster, the visual of what they see. I mean, she's standing behind Jesus over top of him and, and all this oil comes gushing out. And then, now, now you know, this isn't, this isn't some cheap perfume here. This is spikenard. This is the essence, the oil, the essence of spikenard. A little drop or two would have been enough to perfume a person. And everybody said, mm, you smell like spikenard. But here is, here is Jesus, and they see this oil come just, stre- a pound of oil just come streaming down on his head, and then the wave of the smell just rolls over them. Oh, my gosh. They realize what she's done, and they're startled, and they're offended. But Jesus doesn't seem to be either one of those things, does he? he does, and he says, let me tell you something, fellas. Wherever the gospel is preached, They're going to be talking about this woman and what she's done for me. Do you know what she's done? She's anointed me for my burial. I just like to remember that and think about that when we when we get up to Good Friday and we get up to the story of the cross of Jesus, we read about all the things that happened there. We read about the, the scourging and we read about the, the crown of thorns and the smite with the with the reed across his face. They pulled out his beard, they stripped him of his clothes. We read all those things. And we read about the, the, the soldiers who gambled at the foot of the cross for his, for his garments. But do you know there was another element that's not talked about, but it, but it had to be there. There had to have been a moment when those, when those soldiers are, are nailing him to the cross, when they're standing right there under him and they're gambling for his garments, when, when one of them looks at the other and says, Do you see? Why does this man smell like spikenard? Strongly. I mean, it might have been days. It doesn't matter. It still would have been very much on him. The smell of the thankful heart of this woman who'd found what her spirit needed in him. Amen. The thankful heart of this woman who said, Lord, you've given me what I need and I will give you everything that my hope is about. I'm going to pour it all out to you and give it to you. Amen. And and so as he hangs there dying, they're smelling it. And you know what? Our Lord, our Lord was smelling it also. This amazing gift. And it's just a little oil. What is that to God? What is it? But the heart... The heart that gave it was everything. Well, why would she do that? Why would she do that? Can I tell you, I just, as I think about her, I think that she must have been a woman who must have, who must have struggled with some worry, some fears, sense of powerlessness, some anxiety. But when she was with Jesus, when she was in His presence, All that stuff just kind of slid away. I wonder if tonight I might talk with you just a little bit about overcoming some of those things in your own life. About overcoming spiritual anxiety by being a little bit more like Mary. By being like her. Overcoming spiritual anxiety. She overcame it in the presence of Christ and it changed her life. In His words, in His presence... It was everything to her. It brought her it brought her something she probably had thought she would never really know, and that was peace. The Bible says, and you already knew it, that the way of the transgressor is what? Hard. The way of the transgressor, see, it's hard. Even if you even if you're not the worst sinner that anybody ever met, even if most of your neighbors like you, even if your boss thinks you're a grand employee and your wife even says you ain't that bad. You know, here, here, here's the thing. It, it, it is hard on the soul and it is hard on the spirit to be separated from God. Amen? You remember that? Do you remember what it was? Well, you ain't been saved so long you don't remember, do you? You ain't been, you ain't been in, in a part of the body of Christ that you don't remember what it was to be lost, do you? 
Because it was hard. It was hard to feel alone. It was hard to feel separate. It was hard to feel that lack of peace inside the spirit that, 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 that only Christ can heal uh, with his peace. But you know what? Sometimes I believe that even as Christians, sometimes we can battle with and deal with a spiritual anxiety. A spiritual anxiety. And so tonight I want to talk to you just a little bit about that. Anxiety is a, is a uh, cousin of discouragement. A cousin of discouragement. Right? I, we had, had lunch with Pastor and his wife and, and Donna came along. Donna Romine came along. and She's from down where I am. Uh, we, we were sitting there, probably we didn't say it, but I think we were both thinking about how, how y'all people talk funny. Uh, but anyhow, anyhow, uh, while we were talking, we were talking about people that we both knew and who she was kin to. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you meet people, you know, well, I know your family. Oh, you're like, oh, I, oh, I can see the resemblance, right? That's how you talk. Well, did you know that anxiety has a cousin? Anxiety is a cousin of discouragement. They're both favorite weapons the, the enemy uses against us. But God has not, listen to what I'm saying to you now. God has not left his children vulnerable and without help in the battle against either one of those things. And so, friend, if you tonight or any time lately you've been battling your way through anxiety or discouragement, can I tell you something that ought to make you feel a little bit better? even while you're in the middle of that, the Lord sees you and he's not ashamed of you. The Lord sees the battle you're going through and he's not ashamed. The Bible says that he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Amen. He says you belong to me and I belong to you. And if you're going through something, I don't ostracize myself from you. I don't separate myself. I want to come to you and to be a help. God has not left his children vulnerable and without help in the battle against anxiety and discouragement. Before I go further, I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about spiritual anxiety. Spiritual anxiety. There is anxiety that is just purely physical and it's caused. And God can certainly heal that as he can heal any disease. He may choose to do it directly and instantaneously or he may choose uh, to use a physician to help. And so if you've got a chemical, in, well, just do what you've got to do. But, but I'm talking tonight about spiritual anxiety. That is to say it's an anxiety that's born entirely in the working of the mind. An anxiety born out of the thoughts and the habits of the mind. Now, we can get carried away sometimes, and we can say that every cold and every sniffle. You, you, you with me? Hey, listen now, what I'm saying. You know people like this. Every time they blow their nose, they say, oh, it's a demon riding my back. Well, honey, it's not. It's just snot. That's all it was. <laughs> it's snot. <laughs> yeah? Some things are just snot. <laughs> right? Don't be caring. Like, not everything's a spiritual. Pray about it. I mean, you can pray, but put that's not in God's hands too. It's all right. He can handle it. But I'm saying not everything necessarily is a, is a spiritual battle. And we ought to be careful about that. But with that said, I'm convinced that most anxiety, listen to me now. I'm convinced that most anxiety that we deal with, most of the time, it is spiritual rather than physical. That means that mostly, not always, and friend, if you're, the, if you're the, the, on the other side of that, if you're dealing with anxiety, I'm not, I'm not throwing anything at you tonight. I'm just saying that be careful because the patterns that we think and the way we look at things and the attitudes we allow to live inside ourselves, oftentimes those things can contribute to our anxiety and to our uh, discouragement. When we face spiritual anxiety, we ought to recognize it and follow God's prescription for spiritual help. Amen. And so let me read to you in Luke ch chapter 12, verse 29. It says, And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. Nor have an anxious mind. Can I tell you that Jesus wouldn't have said that to you if he didn't really want you to be able to live out the truth of it. Amen. He wouldn't have said to you, don't have an anxious mind if he wasn't willing to empower you to overcome the anxious mind. Amen. He didn't want you to live continually in a depth of anxiety, fear, worry, sense of powerlessness. That's how we were before we were in Christ, unless we was just too dumb to know it, which we probably were a lot of it, right? But, but, but 
in Christ, He wants us to have something else. Amen. Don't have an anxious mind. Be careful about the way you're thinking about things. Now, I was, when I lived in, in Tennessee and pastored down there, I, I drove a school bus. And for the most part, I enjoyed driving a school bus. There were always some days that would strain your patience, but I really did enjoy it. And it, it kind of, in a way, it became a, a sort of ministry. And there were several people that, that, that rode the school bus, kids that rode the school bus, their families ended up coming, uh, coming to church with us. And I remember one particular family, if I remember right, they had a boy in middle school and a, and, a, and a boy and a girl that were a little bit younger than that. I think they were in their upper elementary. And there was just something. They were nice kids, but they just seemed unsettled. There was something about those kids that just seemed like they were, there was just a little something off. And I don't, I don't mean that in a, a speaking ugly about them. I just, there was, you, you know how sometimes you just meet somebody, even kids, you think there's just something that just, that just seems like it just ain't hardly just right here. And I don't know what that was. But anyway, they, they, uh, they started to come to church with us, which I was glad to see. And uh, their family came, and they hadn't come to church. But a, a few times when, they, when, when one of the kids was having a birthday party, and their kids were about the same age my boys are, and they said, what, why don't you bring your boys over for the birthday party? Well, we'll be glad to do that, sure. And so we went over to their house. I knew where they lived because I drove their school bus. And uh, we went uh, to their home, and while the kids were off eating cake and throwing I don't know what they were doing, but anyway, uh, the dad said, well, come on, now, and, I'll, and I'll show you around, show you around the place. I said, okay, all right, and he showed me all over their house and out in the yard, and then we, we kind of circled around and come into the, the, the basement of their house, kind of came in from an outside door into the basement, and, and he, said, uh, he said, now here's our, I'm going to show you our prep room. And I walked into a bunker, right? I walked into a bunker, and I was, there was... There was a, a row of lockers with, with bags under them. And, and there, were, there, were, there were guns in all the lockers and bows and arrows and knives and, and all kind of stuff there. And I thought, well, I guess I'm going to get to be on TV. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I said, um, well, you, you're going to have to tell me what, what this is. And he said, this is our our. Our, our, our prep room, and I said, well, what's with all the lockers? He said, well, every member of our family has a locker, right? I mean, they, all the kids have their locker. You see them bags? That's our, our bug-out bags. And, you know, everybody's got a gun in their locker and a bug-out bag and, and all. And I said, bug out? And he, he said, yeah. I said, well, what, where are you bugging out from? I don't know what it is. He said, brother, when it all starts to go down, we know what we're going to do. We come down here. We get our bags and we go to the woods. And I, I, all I thought was, well, bless these poor kids' hearts, right? I mean, they're growing up. That, I mean, they're growing up to believe. I mean, every day they're being faced with everything that you know is about to come completely apart. Everything you trust in the ground under your feet, you can't even trust. Because, because life is going to get up into just any minute, just any minute. Be ready, kids. Be ready because, because here it comes, right? And I thought, well, Lord, have mercy. It's no wonder that these kids seem like they're just not hardly adjusted just right. It's no wonder that these kids, because they live in constant anxiety, they live in constant fear, they live in the constant stress of all that mess. And all I could think standing there was I thought, you know what, I want to have a prep room too, right? I want you to have a prep room. But I hope your prep room looks a whole lot more like a prayer closet than like a bunker, amen? Because that's how you win. Because that's where the victory is. It's not having your gun around. It's to know how to call on God. It's to know how to call on Jesus and know the peace that Mary found, amen? And to live in His presence and say, God, well, come what may be all right it'll be all right because because you're with me i hope your prep room looks more like a, a prayer closet than a bunker in proverbs chapter 12 verse 25 it says anxiety in the heart of man causes depression but a good word makes it glad what's the good word it literally could be translated good news makes it glad well what is the good news the good news is the best good news I ever heard in my life was that Jesus died for me and was risen again. Amen. I don't know any better news than, than the gospel. And the gospel, oh, it is. Can I tell you that the gospel has healed my heart in ways that I can't talk about? 
I don't know how to put it into words. The gospel has healed my mind and heart in ways that I may not even be aware of, but the gospel has been doing... I hope the gospel has been doing some good in you too. Amen. I hope it has settled the mind and it has released the heart from all the worries and the fears and the anxieties over in the book of Philippians. I'm going to read to you just a little bit there, just a couple verses in chapter 4 of Philippians, verses 6 and 7. And listen to what the Bible says here. It says this, it says, Be anxious for nothing. (laughs) Hallelujah. It's easier to read that than it is to do it though, isn't it? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And listen to verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Verse 6 opens with that little imperative, be anxious for nothing. Now, I, I, I don't know if any of you fellas have I just, I'm speaking as a man, so I can't, I, I don't know the woman's perspective on this. I can only speak from my, own, from my own experience. But sometimes if my wife is a little tore up about something, if she's a little anxious, if she's stressed about something, and I say to her, now honey, you just need to calm down. I mean, that works like magic, don't it? I mean, that's just, you just, I mean, it's like, it's like a magic spell. I mean, just how just soothe, not really. It doesn't do that at all. Exactly the opposite effect. You want to throw gas on that fire, go ahead and say, honey, you just need to calm down. And you know it's all going to come unglued right then, right? I mean, not only is she upset, now she's just plain mad. And if you like mad, then go for it. But if you don't, you might want to say something different. Well, here is this little imperative. And, it, and you know what it says to you here in, in, in verse 6? It says, honey, you just need to calm down. <laughs> it says, be anxious. It says, be anxious for nothing. Well, it sounds good, but how to do it? How to do it? If your heart is anxious, if your mind is troubled, how do you just say, well, it says be anxious for nothing, so I just guess that's what I'm going to do. Well, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit learning to put that on, isn't it? You know what I'm saying to you. Uh, well, the rest of the passage here gives us some keys, but let's, let's start toward the end in verse number 7. And, and what does it say? It says, the peace of God. And already I just feel better when I, when I read that. Because the peace I'm looking for, it reminds me that the peace I'm looking for is not the peace of the world. It's not the peace of everybody liking you better. Are there any people pleasers in here? Be honest. Now don't be lying to me. I ain't the only one. Anybody in here that really kind of addicted a little bit to the approval of other people? And if somebody don't like you, it just lives, it just lodges in your brain. And eats at you. Yeah, yeah, there's a few of us. Okay, all right. And it, you just feel like, well, i got to have it. If, if somebody don't like me, I must be doing something wrong. And what's, what's wrong with me anyway? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, anyway. And so, so here's the thing about that, that, that it's just a fact that it ain't everybody going to like you. It's just a fact that it's not everybody who's going to approve of everything you do, everything you say, everything you believe. The world is never going to give you unanimous consent allowing you to be you. There'll be plenty of people in the world, plenty of voices in the world saying, you know, you really ought to be different than you are. You ought to think different. You ought to be different. You ought to look different than you do. Right? The world will all... But listen now, the Bible doesn't say that the peace of the world will do anything for you. It says that the peace of God, amen, it's God's peace which passes understanding. What that means is that it's never tied to the circumstance you're living in right now. Amen? It rises above that. God doesn't have to adjust circumstances to give you peace. You know that if you're any kind of a praying man or woman already... Because you know that there have been a moment where where you've come before God with a burden on your heart and you didn't know what to do. You didn't know what the answer was. You couldn't see the pathway through. You didn't know how God was going to deliver you. And you prayed and you prayed earnestly. And you just knew in your spirit that God above was listening to you while you prayed. And He just laid His hand on you and said, it's going to be all right." And you didn't even need Him to tell you how. You didn't even need Him to show you what the answer was going to be. You didn't even, even need Him to part the Red Sea for you. You just knew He had it in His hand and it was going to be okay. You got up from prayer, circumstances were exactly the same, but the peace of God had come. Amen. And what does the Bible say here? It says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard 
will guard your hearts and minds. Amen. Will guard your hearts and minds. And how will it guard your hearts and minds? The same, the same way that peace entered into the heart of Mary. And when she watched her whole future dripping between her fingers, down onto the head of Jesus Christ, I have to believe that as much as those other disciples were standing there in shock, disbelief, and anger, Mary stood there in absolute and utter calm of God's peace washing over her. It's all right. It's all right because I'm with him. It's all right because he's right. He's right here. And it's going to be okay through Jesus Christ. Through Je There's no real lasting help for spiritual anxiety apart from the grace of Christ. Did you know that? If you're battling your way through spiritual anxiety, and I, I'm, you may try lots of things, go for a walk, <laughs> go for a hike, go for, I don't know what else you're going to do, but, but can I tell you that don't leave Christ out. Don't leave trust in Him. Don't leave searching for His presence out because that's what's going to change everything. That's what's going to make it all different. And remember there was, well, I'm going to skip that. I started to say, so I think I'll leave that out. Sometimes wisdom is knowing what not to say. It says this peace of God will guard your heart and mind against anxiety. It'll guard your heart and mind against depression. It'll guard your heart and mind against discouragement. And I'm not, listen, uh, friend, don't, don't mistake me. I'm not, I'm not telling you that if you're, if you're dealing with anxiety, I'm not telling you if you're dealing with depression and discouragement, I'm not telling you there's sin in that, okay? I'm not, I'm not telling you there's, there's something wrong with you that's God's angry. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is don't forget that God sees that and He wants to enter into it with you. Amen. And so just keep looking to Him and keep, and keep leaning on Him and, and, and every bit of that. And it, says, and it says when you have that, when you have this presence of God, when you have this Christ and His grace and His peace guarding your heart and mind, then you know what you can do? You can do what verse 6 says. You can fight your way to this point where you can say, Lord, you've said it and I can do it. I can be anxious. I can be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a powerful, important thing. I put a license plate on the front of my truck. I was having an odd mood and I just decided to put a license plate on my truck and, and had them make it for me in Latin. And it says, Gratis Semper. I don't know why I had it in Latin. It just come over me to do it that way. I wanted to see if anybody had asked me what it, what it meant. And it meant always thankful. Always thankful. A little reminder, always, always be thankful. With thanksgiving. Prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to this God who loves to listen to you pray. He loves to hear what's on your heart. He loves to make all the time in the world. He created time to start with. He can make some time for you. Amen. Over in the book of 1 Peter. I lost where I was going. There it is. Right here marked with the ribbon that I had for it. Over in the book of 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 6 through 9. It says, therefore humble yourselves. Now there's a good clue also right there. If you get proud, anxiety may find you. Anxiety sometimes comes to us in our proud moment. And then it's a gift kind of when that happens, isn't it? But it says, what does it say here? It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Verse 7 says, casting all your care upon Him for He cares for you. Amen. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom... He may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, as we said last night, in the faith. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And I tell you, if you're, if you're dealing with anxiety, if you're dealing with, with stress in the mind, if you're dealing with depression, there is somebody else sitting in this building right now going through the same thing. You are not alone. You're not, you're not the outlier, the odd case. Everybody here has battled through that at some point. Somebody here is going through it right now. Amen, amen, amen. Can I just give you some practical tips? We know it's all through Christ Jesus. We know that it's all through submitting to Him. We know it's all through being in His presence. 
living in His prayer. He gives us the power to overcome. That's what Mary found out. That's why she put her whole life and future in His hands. If I could just give you some practical little things that you could, you could use to express that with. Number one, first thing I'd say to you is, if you're not, you need to be saved. Because the way of the transgressor is hard. Because if you're not born again, if you're not saved, there is the great reality of your sin which produces a gulf between you and God. Because God hates your sin with a passionate, passionate hatred. I mean, that's the Bible. That's what it says. And while He wants desperately to save you, He, will, he, he can't save you in your sin. He just needs to save you from it. Amen. He wants to draw. If you're not saved, get saved. Amen. Oh, it's very, very, very expensive to get saved. I can't tell you that it don't cost anything. It costs a great deal. But he paid it. Christ paid it. Christ paid it for you. Amen? Be careful when you tell somebody, by the way, let me just step into our little rabbit trail for a moment. <laughs> can't help it. Be careful when you're telling people about the gospel of Jesus. Don't make it sound cheap. Don't focus so much on the fact that it's free that it sounds cheap. A relative of mine just bought the sky lift at Natural Bridge State Park. You can climb the mountain the hard way or you can get on the sky lift and ride it up. Take your little, little, little swinging dangling carriages on a wire or take you to the top and hang you right off the edge of that cliff, right? People look up at it and say, I don't know. I don't know about that. They just bought the sky lift and the first thing they did was triple the cost to ride it. You know what happened when they, when they raised the price to ride it? A lot more people rode it. You think, why did more people ride it when, when it cost more? They trusted it more. When it didn't cost much, they looked up and thought, they ain't getting me on $5 to ride that little wire up to the top of that. I ain't doing it. All of a sudden, 17 bucks says, you know what? I bet that's pretty safe. I bet that's, they probably do a good job with that. Why, if it wasn't good, people wouldn't pay that for it. So I'll pay that for it. I'll get on it. Don't make the, listen to me, don't make the gospel cheap. Just because, it, because let me tell you something, the gospel, this gospel costs so, it was the most expensive thing. I know Elon Musk just bought Twitter for $44 billion. I've sure seen times in my life I couldn't have bought something for $44. <laughs> right? Yeah. $44 billion, that's an expensive purchase. Can I tell you that it remains true that the most expensive purchase that was ever paid for in the history of the world is when Jesus Christ paid for the souls of lost men and women when he died on the cross. Never before, never before, never since was ever such a price paid for a thing. It's very, very, very expensive, but the price has already been paid. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. It's extremely, it's extremely costly, but it's not a cost to you as far as that kind of thing. Get saved. Number two, live your life. Live your life in constant agreement with God. So many times, and I probably have harped on this already, <laughs> but so many times we believe that we just have one prayer to pray to, to be right with God. Right? I just have one prayer to pray. Go pray the prayer at the altar and get saved, and then that's all the repenting that I'll ever need to do. You know what I think repentance really is before it can possibly mean anything else? Repentance before it can mean anything else must simply just mean agreeing with God. First thing God says to you is that you're a sinner and you're deserving of hell. And can you agree with that or can't you? Well, if you're here tonight and you call yourself a Christian, I hope you've had that moment where you agreed with God. If you didn't agree with Him, you're not saved. You're not born again. You hadn't done that. I don't care how long you've taught Sunday school or, or, or sung song or whatever it is that you do around here. If, if you never did that, you need to come get saved tonight. Right? You've got to agree. With, but, but now let me tell you, can I, can I tell you that you've got to go on agreeing with God? And God will show you things. God will... God'll, God will take you down places and, and put you through things where, where what He is doing is He is showing you all the things in your heart that still don't quite reflect what He wants them to reflect. Amen. And so what we've got to do, we've got to just keep agreeing with God. And if that means keep repenting, keep repenting. But live a life. Live a life in constant agreement with God. Because when you get out of agreement with God, you get out of joint with Him. And, 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 and I, don't, I don't want to tell you that every time that you get something a little out of joint, God says, that's it, you're out. But, but it does mean that there's a problem. And that problem has the potential to be devastating to you. Right? And, and, and one of the first signs of a devastation to you is that it's going to bring all kind of anxiety and fear. Not every time that you have anxiety is that it. But, but start with that. Live your life in constant agreement with God. Guard your mental input. How many of you watch the news? 
How many of you watch the news a lot? How many of you watch the news too much? Can I tell you, it's okay to turn that mess off every now and then. You don't know, need to know every bad thing happening in the world. And not only that, you don't need to know every commentator's prognostication about everything that might happen in the world. You know, we, we sit glued to our television. I mean, they beam it right into your house for you, don't they? Used to be come in that antenna, you got to get out and turn, but now it's on that satellite and you just watch it. Or you get it on the computer, you watch it on your phone. We're constantly bombarding ourselves with, with information. You say, well, it's all right, it don't cost nothing. Can I tell you a secret? Something is being sold. You just don't know what the product is. The product is you. You're being sold. You're the thing that's being marketed. And the more sensational, the more catastrophic, the more awful they can make everything in the world sound, the more you're going to stay right there and they'll keep selling you off to their advertisers. They'll keep selling you off over and over and over. Sometimes, let me, I'm not telling you to go stick your head in the sand. I'm not telling you that you should know what's going on in the world basically. But can I tell you, at some point, it's got to be enough. At some point, it's got to be enough. Turn it off. Just turn it off. Guard your mental input. Guard what you let come into your mind. Guard, if you've got people around you, listen to me now. If you got, I know you want to be the salt and the light in the world, and you ought to be. You ought to be the salt and the light in the world. You ought to be able to be in the world and rub shoulders with people who, who don't know Jesus, who don't believe the gospel. You ought to be able to be in the world. But listen to me now. You've got you to balance that a little bit, okay? You've got you to put that away because if you're constantly around people who are just pouring negative thinking into your mind, if that's what you're taking in all the time, listen, you can't sustain that for very long. Amen? And so you've got you to get away from that. Back over in the book of Philippians chapter 4, uh, I read that to you earlier about, about what the peace of God will do. It'll come in. But listen, what it says right after that is this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, amen, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, are lovely, are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Don't always meditate on what's wrong. Just give it to God sometimes and say, God, the world is too big, it's too hard. I just want to sit at Jesus' feet for a few minutes. I just I don't need to fix everything. I just need to know the Savior. I just need to be with Him. And I, yet, Lord, maybe you call me to go out there and do something. And I'll try to my best to be faithful when I know. But I'm not going to go out there and tackle it all on my own. I can't do it. And so, Lord, I'm just going to sit here until I feel an unction. Amen. Guard your mental input. And then, then I would say to you, guard your, guard your vocal output. What, what are you talking about? What are you saying? What fills the language that you spew toward yourself and toward everybody else? If you talk about how awful everything is, do you, do you know what you're going to do? You're going to disrupt all that peace of God that God wants to have in your heart. Amen. If all you can talk about is all the negative, if all you can talk about is all the things that are wrong and scary and bad, can I, can I just say to you that, I mean, that ain't good. It ain't good, okay? All right. Guard your, guard your mental input, but also guard your vocal output. Who, anybody been lied to? Who's the worst liar you know? Who's lied to you more than anybody else has? I tell you who's lied more to me than anybody else has. I have. I've, I've told more lies to myself than anybody I could accuse of it, right? It's been me. And, and the thing is, I believe it. I'm the biggest sucker when it comes to lying to myself. I believe about everything I tell me, right? You probably believe about everything you tell you. You catch other people and you don't catch yourself. Can I tell you, if, if you're not careful, learn, learn, to speak, learn to speak biblically. I don't know that you need to necessarily go out there and be one of those people that memorizes the whole New Testament verse by verse. Wouldn't hurt you none, but I mean, you know, you might, probably can't do it. But you can, you can and just, just normalize it. I want you to just, just start to make it normal to yourself. I know your family will think you're crazy. I know they'll think you're some kind of weird fanatic. But if you just learn to start speaking things, just, just biblical things, when, when you just answer things, when people say something to you, when, when you're just in your everyday conversation, if you just start saying, well, the Bible says. 
and say that. Yeah, it's going to run some people off. You probably won't miss them too bad. Be all right. Be okay. But when, 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 you, when you start speaking the things that God has said in the Scripture, do you know, do you know there's a great power in that? The next thing I'll say to you, I've got just about, I've said five, I think I might have six. Fellowship. Fellowship with those who, who dwell in peace. If people have, people have peace in their heart, just get close to them, right? If people, if people just have, and you, you know what I'm talking about. There are people who just carry with them a spiritual calm. And, and, and listen, I know if I'm talking to people here under the age of 30, when I talk about peace and calm, they probably ain't all into that yet. You'll get old enough one day when it's going to mean something to you. It might already, I don't know. But can I tell you, it's still a good thing, no matter where you're at in life. Find some people to be around that dwell in a spiritual calm because some of that's going to rub off on you. Amen? Some of that's going to help you. And the last thing I want to say to you before I get back to trying to talk about Mary just a little bit is have some, have some good fun along the way. Have some good fun along the way. It's all right. It's not, it's not unchristian. It's not, it's not anything wrong with it. Have some fun. And there's lots of opportunities to have fun along the way. I tell you what I've taken, I've tried to do, I've tried to take one of those things that can be a real nuisance, one of those things that can really aggravate you and take away your peace in life, and I've tried to have some fun with it. And so I don't know if you have what I've got, the problem that I have, but there are about two blocks of time in any given day when my phone starts ringing. And it's, you know, you know the people that call you. They're probably trying to sell you, either a car warranty, or in my case, I don't know how this happened. I'm 44 years old, and I've gotten on the call list for some company that deals with Medicare enrollees trying to sell them an additional supplement. And I've told them over and over, call me 21 years from now, and we'll talk about it, but I can't talk to you now. I'm right. I mean, but they call me every day, every day. I mean, and I used to get aggravated and mad, and then, you know, when you get mad, then all, all your peace goes out the window, and you just, and, and, I, and I find, I just, I thought, Lord, help me with this. And then they didn't call for a, a, a week or two. And, and then he called me. I mean, you know, the, I mean, it's, and nothing against foreign people or anything like that, but it always does kind of amuse me halfway when they, when they give you a name that you know it ain't their name because they struggle with it. <laughs> when the guy says, this is, uh, my, na my name is David, David. Uh, I think it's David. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> well, you pick one and we'll go with that. Um, and, and, but, but he, you know, they start, they start, they didn't call me. Old David didn't call me for a, for a couple weeks. And I thought, well, God, I guess you helped me by not letting him call me. And then he called me again. And I answered the phone. And he said, hello, how, how, this is David with, with, with uh, Senior Benefit. Uh, how are you? I said, David, I'm okay, but let me ask you this, buddy. How are you doing? I've been worried to death about you. I thought something had happened to you, man. I said, I was afraid maybe you died on me. I didn't know you hadn't called me in a couple weeks. I said, you've got to talk to me, buddy. How are you doing here? What's going on in your life? Amen. And uh, a little while back, another guy from the same place, he called me and he, and he, he, called, and he says this, he said, I, I, think, I think you have, you, have, um, you have Medicare Part A and Part B. And I said, no, I don't. I said, should I have that? And he said, yes, you should have that. And I said, well, I want it. Sign me up for it. And sign me up for anything else that you can give me to go along with it. I mean, this gets a guy's blood going, right? I mean, hey. We got one, and, and, and he, 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 I said, because if, if I'm supposed to have it, brother, I want it. Get me, get me on the roll for it. I want that Medicare. And he said, wait, wait, how, how old are you? And I said, I'm 44. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, no, man, listen, you said I need it, and I want it. And he said, no, 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 sir, you, you can't have it. And I said, I said, no, buddy. I said, listen, you've got me tore up now. I said, I... I feel like there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way, a loophole, a program. I need your help. Get me on the list. And he starts shouting through the phone. He says, you can't have it. You can't have it. You can't have it. And I said, okay, call me back in 21 years, man. <laughs> you got, I mean, you know, they're going to call you anyway. You might as well bleed off a little stress is all I'm saying, right? I had, but my favorite one, I got to thinking about that. Lord, you know, I really, even as a pastor, we get, sometimes we get, we get lost in just being, being constantly in the church and, and being around Christian folk and, and, and talking to them. You, you, if you're not careful, and especially it's been a little weird over the last couple of years, you're not out among people as much. 
And so you, you kind of get out of habit. You're not careful. You get out of habit of just, of just sharing the gospel with a stranger, right? Right? And so, so, so he calls me back. And he says, uh, he's, whatever is the name they're using that day. This is so-and-so. Uh, how are you today? And I said, let me just tell you. I said, I'm so glad you asked me how I'm doing today. I said, I am blessed beyond all measure. Can I tell you that God has been good to me? Because I'm going to tell you what God has done. I want you to know I am fully deserving of hell and all the wrath of God. But God sent his son into the world to die for me so that I could be born again. He's given the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and he raised him up and he's my Lord and Savior and he lives in my heart. He's filled me with the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad. I said, how about you? Do you know the Lord? Do you have him in your heart? And he says, huh. Huh. Oh, I was that like 12 times. Huh. I'd start to say something. He'd say, huh. I don't know what was going on in his mind. But I thought, you know what? They're going to call me anyway. You know, we, we said, well, I wish I had the Lord to give me the chance to share the gospel with them. They've called you 15 times today. Have a little fun. Learn to do that. Tell them about the gospel. The world, really, if we just take a moment, if we take a moment and we get over ourselves a little bit, we can have, we can have a little fun. We can have a little enjoyment. Amen. We can lose a little stress and anxiety. Some things that we get mad about, if we find some laughter in them. The Bible says laughter doeth good like a medicine. Um, I come back, though, in the end. I come back, and I think, about, I think about Mary. And I think about the life that she was living. I think about her life and how it must have been hard beyond what the Scripture, but beyond what these, these men writing the... The, the gospel accounts, and I know they were under the leading of the Holy Spirit in writing that, but they didn't, they didn't talk too much about Mary's inward life, what it must have been like, except to say that one night she looked at her life and she just measured what she was and what she had and what future she might have. And she just said, you know what, if I just put all of that in the hands of Christ and let Him take care of it, it's going to be okay. And so our, our, our Savior went to the cross. And it doesn't tell us, told us, told us what they saw, what they heard. But I tell you, I'm convinced of it. That when our Savior went to the cross, He went there under the fragrance of someone's complete and absolute trust in Him. I think once before I was preaching here and I was talking about Gethsemane when Jesus was battling with his own struggle there. I wonder if a part of what helped him through that, I know the angels came and ministered, but I wonder if a part of what helped him through that was that smell of spikenard still on the air. There's somebody depending on you. There's somebody depending on you. And he said, I'm not letting her down. You know that he will be just as committed to you as he was to Mary. You know, if you put yourself completely in his hands, just say, Lord, I just, I just need you more than I need to be prepped for anything in the world. I just need to be in the presence of my Lord and Savior. And it is enough. It is enough. Can I just give you a little bit of an invitation tonight? Can I just say to you that if you have an anxiety in your heart, You've got something you're worried over that just seems to keep eating at you. If you're battling some discouragement, if you're struggling with some depression, I'm not telling you for a moment that you're sinning. Not at all. Not at all. Can I just tell you, don't quit entrusting that to Christ. In His presence is life. In His presence is peace. Quit struggling so hard to stamp out your anxiety and your depression. Just get in His presence and stay there. Just stay there as long as you can, every chance you can. It's going to get better. It's going to be better. A few little things that we talked about. Do these things. Laugh when you can at whatever you can. Amen? Be careful about what you let in your mind. Be careful about what you let out of your mouth. Make it all about Jesus Christ because it says in the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. How? Through Christ Jesus. I think, I think people are struggling with these kinds of things more right now. 
than maybe they have in a while. Or maybe it's just on the surface more right now. I think we need this. We need to remember the example of that woman and what she did. Anyway, I'm finished with talking. Our brother will come and lead us in a song. Thank you so very much. When my soul was disturbed with sorrow, when my heart was burdened with sin, Jesus opened his arms of mercy. Beautiful message. Jesus said it well. Peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives unto you, but as I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. And everyone here knows there's a lot of anxiety instigators in this world. You can try to hide, but it'll find you. See it with your own eyes when you go into a store, no matter where you go. Jesus said, when you pray, you talk about an anxiety killer, Brad. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet. And the only way you're going to shut that anxiety out is shut the door. It's necessary for us to get alone with God and to get into that calm that the brother talked about. We all have anxious cares. We're worrying about everything and anything today. See everything unraveling. But if we can find that secret place and get that door shut, you'll be able to weather the storms of anxiety and discouragement. And I believe there's people here who have all kinds of anxiety. And it does distract us. And it creates doubt and fear. 
but oh, to get into the presence of God. Come into a service like this and hear a message like this. Wow. I just feel like there's folks here that need to pray. So we're going to sing another verse. Beautiful song our brother has chosen. A beautiful message our brother has delivered. And he's right. Anxiety is kin to discouragement. And when you're full with anxiety and full with discouragement, the devil's benched you. You can't even get into the battle hardly. What a great message. Let's not let it fall to the ground. Let's let it fall into our hearts. So God bless you as we sing another verse. There are storms that we all for that. heart satisfied how many enjoyed the message how many can relate to the message and Brad you haven't been tormented until you have Aetna as your insurance they call us a dozen times a day I've been tempted to get a whistle but I don't want to be responsible for breaking somebody's eardrums. All right. Thank God for the message. How many felt like you were in church tonight? How many felt lifted? Amen? All right. All right. Tomorrow evening, we're going to take a love offering for Brother Brad, and uh, you might want to pray about that. And uh, we're looking forward to the service already. And thank God he has such a wonderful delivery and a wonderful spirit. The kind of guy you can listen to all night. Don't get any crazy ideas. All right, Father, thank you for this service. And thank you, oh God, for the word. And thank you for speaking to our anxious cares, our anxieties, our discouragements, our doubts, our fears. And just remind us, oh God, that there is peace in Jesus in time of trouble. And how we thank you for the peace and the calmness that you have brought to your people. Although the world is shaking and coming apart, we can still have peace in time of trouble. And we thank you for that peace, that peace of God that is in our hearts. Lord, go with us now, give us rest, and bring us back tomorrow with an anxiousness to worship Thee again. In Jesus' name, amen. You're all dismissed. Very good service.